into New Hampshire. Uh, I think we started to see those white following. Actually, in the very beginning, I noticed a bright light in the sky. We thought it was a plane, so we stopped the car to get out to look at it. And that's when uh, it changed direction and started coming in towards us. I'm trying to attract the attention of this craft. I'm telling it, come on in. Hi. I got the window down. I'm yelling to him. Hi, hi. Who are you? It left the top of the mountain, came out over the highway and stopped. It made it out directly in front of us. Bobby got out with the binoculars in an attempt to identify the craft. And when he looked up, he saw a circular window. And he saw these men standing behind the window looking down at him. And he became frightened. Ran back to the car saying he thought they were trying to capture him. And we went speeding down the highway to avoid capture. But Barney turned off onto a side road. And he was a group of men he'd seen on the craft standing in the middle of this road, blocking our way. And naturally he had to stop the car. And they came up in two groups, took us out of the car. Pass in the woods to where the craft was on the ground. There's nothing on earth quite like the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Beautiful and rugged, endless forest and rock. Stark contrasts everywhere you look. On September 20th, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill claimed they were abducted by a UFO. And in the waning years since the event, they've become ufological icons. We've come to the White Mountains to experience a place with a rich history of UFO sightings that stretches back into the 1800s. Amongst the crew with us for this trip are Alexander Petikoff and skeptically minded investigator Adam Dugan. I've avoided looking too deeply into the abduction side of the subject. Maybe because I just didn't find the time, or maybe because deep down, I'm aware there's something so primal and terrifying about it. People around the world have claimed for centuries to have been taken aboard craft of unknown origin and been mutilated, maimed, and experimented upon. If I'm going to look into this topic, then there's no better place to start than where it all began.
The White Mountains are a part of the Appalachian Mountain Range that covers almost a quarter of the state in New Hampshire and stretch into Maine. It's home to Mount Washington, the highest peak in the northeastern United States. By far, this region's most infamous ufological event was the Betty and Barney Hill abduction, which occurred just down the street from Franconia, where we're staying while in the area. They had larger eyes than ours, smaller nose, and smaller mouth, no protruding part of the ear and no hair. I was taken into this first room, and uh, it was quite bare. And it was a small table, it was a stool. They put me on a stool, checked my eyes, ears, nose, throat, my feet, my hands. And then he put me on a table and said they were going to check my nervous system. And then he tried to insert a needle-like instrument in my navel, which caused pain. Then they examined all the left and went into the room where Barney was. With Barney, most of the exam was the same as mine, except they were interested in his bone structure. I mean, they were feeling all up and down his spine, his arms and all, basically. There's a whole subset of people within ufology who support, believe in, and, and write about and research the large number of cases of abductees. And when I use a, that term, uh, what that means is that it's someone who claims that they have been abducted by aliens, sometimes on more than one occasion, and typically studied physically with medical examinations and so forth. In terms of abductions, I think it's an area of these phenomena that many people aren't willing to go to or to face. The fact that it's happening again now, recently, uh, kind of scares me. You know, I thought maybe this was something that happened at one point in time and it was just a weird phenomenon that was occurring and uh, that we'd never deal with it again. It's a really dark path. There are thousands, if not, and I think most likely hundreds of thousands of people across, well, right here in the United States itself, who believe that they've had experiences with aliens. It's kind of where the contactee movement went, where as opposed to just messages, these people feel that they are being taken into a craft, that medical experiments are being done on them, and then they're being dropped off again. I was, probably, I was one of the first in the country to investigate alleged abduction cases. We had numerous reports around Western Pennsylvania. We could have spent full time working on just abduction reports, because you can spend weeks and months and years on one case. And we have multitudes of reports coming in all the time. So we did the best we could. Uh, to my, you know, my way of looking at things, it's Betty and Barney Hill and their case that really introduces the idea of an involuntary period of time where you're experimented upon, shown various things, and then taken back to your normal life with some sort of missing time. Betty and Barney Hill's experience opened the door for a flood of similar reports to begin coming in. Where previously, encounters with aliens had been relegated to the accounts of those in the contactee movement, there was now another way for those who claimed experiences with extraterrestrials to quantify it for the general public. The Hills reported physical and emotional ramifications that flew in the face of the typically benevolent Space Brothers encountered by contactees, and seemed to point toward a force that approached humanity with detached clinical precision. Despite the popularity of the Hills story, it would be decades before the abductee phase of ufology really kicked off. In the meantime, investigators and researchers began to look at some historical reports in the context of a post-abduction world. There was a, a very important, I think, and in, in, in famous case, which is the uh, James Everill case, 1638, down in along the Charles River, the Muddy River, in Cambridge, Boston area. And it was a case where uh, James Everill, he and two others went out one night, and they went down river. They're going to go out and inspect hides that had come in on their boat in a lighter, which is a, a small, probably like a you know, rowboat type device to get out. And what was curious is, as the light was seen over Charlestown that night, uh, that was in the shape of, uh, they call it the shape of a swine, which is interesting. It's a green light that ran to and forth back from Charlestown over Boston. 
uh, down towards Watertown. And the only thing I can think of that shape is obviously a cigar dirigible shape. The most interesting part of it was is that this took place for a, a, over two hours, apparently, because James Edward mentioned that he and his two companions, two hours later after seeing the green light, found themselves up back where they'd begun their journey against the tide. I mean, so the tide was, say, like outgoing. And now two hours later after seeing this, they're, they're back where they started. Yeah, I I guess, uh, about that one. It almost seems like a, a very early... I think, it's a, I, I think it's a classic thing of two hours of missing time, what we would call today like with Betty and Bonnie Hill you know, an, alien, an alien abduction. The thing that I find the most compelling about it, really, is that we can again tie this into historical accounts, delve back into folklore and look at the concept that, you know, in early days, people in Europe talked about the Fae and they describe abduction stories. Oh, I met these little people and I had uh, a visit with them in their banquet hall. And then when I came back, I thought I had been gone two hours, but it was three days. So oftentimes people will point towards UFO stories or abduction stories being incredibly similar to fae or fairy stories that we have from the British Isles. One of the ways that this comes out is through what they call changeling stories, which is where fairies come in the night to replace the baby of a woman who has recently given birth. And the woman knows that it's not her child. Either it's crying all the time, or the baby was crying all the time, and now it's completely silent. Like, behaviorally, the child is different. And without an explanation for that, she offers up the idea that it's a changeling. More often than not, this is a very poor end for the child, where it's then abandoned in the woods, for example, because the mother knows beyond a shadow of a doubt it is not her child. Instead, it's a child of the Fae. There are some old abduction cases, but they're very rare. And what you get far more often in the cases of, even like the airship, run, and the airship flaps. There was a sense in which people could interact with the occupants of those vehicles. To these strange ships, whatever they were, would occasionally land and people would be invited to come on board and even tour the facilities, as it were. So it really isn't until much later that these start to become a, a situation where the abductee is taken against their will. I remember one case, and this has been north of Pittsburgh, but I did have an opportunity to go up and interview this person, because this always stuck with me, and this is probably late 1960s. This fellow would get up early during the night, early morning hours, and would go out in the middle of the woods, and allegedly was going aboard this object that was landed on the ground, and had various types of physical experiments and whatever going on. The one thing I remember him mentioning, what these little creatures look like, and he said they looked like Pillsbury Doughboys. And I always thought it was such a great description because that was long before you were really hearing much about the greys and these small humanoid creatures. The general public didn't know a lot about it back then. In the late 80s and early 90s, the abduction phenomenon was pushed into the spotlight thanks to books like Communion, movies like Fire in the Sky, and television shows like The X-Files. Travis Walton's purported abduction while in the forests of eastern Arizona was in the limelight for years and may have helped to push pop culture even further into embracing a subject that had been overlooked since the hills. Mostly, pop culture portrayed abductions in the ways the hills or Walton relayed their own experiences, with strange lights coming to take victims into the air where they were inevitably experimented on in an increasingly grisly fashion. Despite what Hollywood was saying, this wasn't the encounter that all experiencers claimed to have. And very often, the contact seemed to defy rational explanation. In many instances, the events were so bizarre, they left the victim believing that it was little more than a surrealist nightmare. Donovan Smith believes he experienced something that defies explanation when he was just a kid, and that the event points to an abduction experience. Despite taking place decades ago, the event still affects him deeply today, but has left him wondering if maybe he didn't simply dream the whole thing up. Well, it was around 91 to 92. I was, it was late night, I was uh, sleeping, I woke up, I had to use the restroom. We had three bedrooms and we had three kids, so two of us had to share a bedroom, so we had bunk beds in one of the rooms. I happened to be sleeping on the bottom bunk, and uh, one night I woke up and I swung my feet over the side of the bed and I was just sitting there. I looked down, and there was nothing and I looked back up and I went to go stand up and I couldn't stand up for some reason. 
So I looked back down, and when I looked uh, down, I saw what appeared to be like green mist, some kind of green, greenish mist, pretty solid and it was swirling around my feet. And so I tried to stand up and I couldn't. And I, you know, I figured it's probably because of the mist or whatever. And I didn't know what it was. And it looked like it was coming from underneath my bed. When it was around my ankles, it looked almost like uh, shackles almost kind of, because it was more solid in the middle, like it was all connected as one big thing. And then the next thing I know, I just, I looked up again, looked back down, the stuff was gone and I could stand up. And after that, I got really nervous, so I went and used the restroom. And when I came back, I was so scared that I jumped onto my bed because I didn't want to get my feet anywhere near the bottom of the bed because I didn't know if something, you know, was underneath the bed or what it might have been. About a day or two later, there was a kid in my neighborhood who told me that he saw a big uh, black triangle looking in the spaceship in the, in the sky. And he said that uh, I had lights that looked like a V shape. Uh, I'm not sure if it was what, when he saw it, but it was around that exact time that that stuff happened to me. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, you always look back and you're like, you know, did it really happen? Was it real? But, you know, it's so vivid in my memory. I see the picture, you know, I could see it clear as day every time, you know, every time I think about it. So this is where a folklorist will take a step back and they'll apply two different theories. The first is called the cultural source hypothesis theory which is a theoretical perspective where people who have had experiences of the supernatural are formulating their stories or their experiences solely based on a cultural understanding of what that should look like. Experiential source hypothesis is the almost exact opposite of that, where it says that people might have a minor cultural awareness of supernatural paranormal phenomena, but instead when they're sharing their stories, it's based on something that actually happened to them. That's unexplainable, we don't know what it is. So it's not necess necessarily saying a UFO is an alien spaceship, but instead what it's saying is that the UFO is something unidentified, it's something they don't know what it is. And when they talk about their story of seeing that or being abducted or having any type of contact with that, their story is formulated based on their experience. I think we should have scientists and especially psychologists looking at this to figure out, is this just mental? Is there a physical side to it? What's going on here? Um, even if it is just kind of a, a emotional manifestation that happens, you know, why is that? Do these people need to be treated? What's going on here? Traveling the seemingly serene landscapes of some sections of the White Mountains gives me a greater appreciation for how alone and isolated the hills must have felt back in 1961. Here, you're never very close to any real signs of civilization, and even during the daylight hours, you get a sense of isolation. It's chilling to think about traveling these same roads late at night, almost 60 years ago, before there were even the modest houses, gas stations, and villages that have grown up around the area since. The Hills abduction set the stage for many experiencers to come forward with their own encounters, but it also helped establish tropes that have been reported ever since. From physical after effects like scars and markings on abductees to supposed alien implants recovered from those taken, the phenomenon has continued to grow only stranger in the waning years. This includes the theories as to why people are being abducted to begin with. People who are experiencers talk very frequently about the idea of hybrid alien human children especially male and female experiencers will say that their biological anatomy has been utilized for the production of a hybrid child. There are some that even feel that they have been, uh, for women, impregnated or for men, that, that semen samples have been taken. And then a step beyond that is there's a group of people who believe they've had children that they believe are hybrid children, that they're showing on these spacecraft and, and things like this. So when we talk about conspiracy theories, there's one other one that we should probably touch on. That is a conspiracy involved with alien abduction and the idea that aliens are running some kind of a breeding program or a hybridization program. And it's this concept that there's either something wrong with the genetics of this alien race or they want to possibly invade our world in a more insidious way by creating alien-human hybrids. 
locations where a high volume of UFO sightings come in are frequently associated with abductions, and nowhere is this more prevalent than the Hudson Valley. During the 1980s and 90s, a string of triangular UFO reports flooded in from around the area. The Hudson Valley Flaps connection with famed abductee Whitley Strieber is often overlooked, but Strieber was living in the Pine Bush area of the valley in 1985 when the events that went on to inform his best-selling abductee recounting Communion was written. Strieber wasn't the only witness having contact with the pilots of the craft seen around the area at the time. When I first started my research, I really expected that 99% of the stories would be, oh, I saw a distant light in the sky. The largest chapter in my book turned out to be abductions. More often than not, I don't, I, I don't have a percentage for you, but I think the majority of these close sightings ended up in some sort of missing time, in some sort of contactee experience, or just out and out abductions. It was rampant, particularly in the 1980s. I, I remember I, I, I saw this object. Um, we lived by a quarry, so there was uh, like a mountaintop at the end of my road. And I saw a craft there in the daytime when I was a little boy. You know, my whole childhood growing up, I had these experiences. And I saw this craft over the trap rock and the uh, I told my father at one point, and we walked up there. He took me by the hand and walked up the road, and he sent me back home because I couldn't climb up the mountain. And I don't know what he was going up there for, really. I guess he saw it, too. You know, I went back home. I'm not really sure if I went back home by myself or waited for him to come down or, or, or what, but different things happened to me through my life at different periods. and. We moved from the house, I think, when I was about 10 years old. We moved from where we were to a, another town, and I don't remember any experiences happening until I got married and I moved, I moved up here. Uh, one night, I went to the store to get some beer. It was a Friday night. I kept getting this feeling to go out, to go out to the store. I didn't really want to go out. It was like one of the coldest nights of the winter. I remember seeing these lights moving through the woods that night. I went down this back road. The store is about 10 minutes away. And as I made a right to follow this ridge, the, uh, this craft was kind of appeared over the ridge, and it kept pace with my car. As I drove along, and I kept looking up at it, and it was just moving with me over the trees. And at one point, I came around a turn, and it was down on the ground, this big light. And it looked like a big egg of shape, you know, but it was house size. And there was uh, mist swirling all around it. And I distinctly remember. And then I remember just having this feeling come over my body, it started tingling, and all my hair was like standing up. And the next thing I knew, I, I started my vehicle and drove off. And I, so I went down to the store, and when I got there, it was midnight. And I'd left the house about 10 o'clock. And anyway, I got some beer and I went home. I didn't drink it because it was too late already. But you know, I went home, my wife was hysterical. Were there physical effects from, from any of this? That you can talk about or that well, after after that event, I don't know if it was the same night, because um, a lot of things started happening after I had that encounter there on the road. Um, but one morning, I woke up, and there was dried blood coming out of my nose. It was all over, dried all over my face. Um, scoops in the back of my neck here that you can put your finger in, actually. It's shaped in a triangle. Any idea what was going on with, you know, your, your nose or anything? No, but years later, uh, I, I had triplets, and one morning when I went in to, to say goodbye to them, 
They all had blood coming out of their nose. You know, they were sleeping, but all of them had blood dried on their face coming out of their nose, like what had happened to me as an adult. But On many cases, all kinds of physical effects, ill feeling, the classic nosebleeds, scoop marks, there was a whole variety of it. I, I have not gotten a lot of, I was on a table in a, in a craft type thing. Mostly, I don't know what just happened to the last two hours. And then it happened to my brother, and I found out that my child is now experiencing it. So a lot of abduction experiences, many, many multi-generational experiences as well. I remember speaking to the first abductee face to face I ever did and her husband sitting next to her and uh, he was holding her hand so tight as she was recalling her abduction experience to me and she was just bawling her eyes out. With hers being so traumatic, was it an ongoing situation or just a one-time event? It started as a one-time event until she started having reoccurring dreams that other things have happened. Whether or not those dreams or those memories are real or not, I can't say. But she believes it was ongoing. What do you, do you think there's any time with uh, genetic backgrounds, certain runs in families? The idea that abdu the abduction phenomenon um, has some sort of relation to lineage or ancestry or even bloodlines is very fascinating. When you do look at it, a lot of these people who are claiming to have been abducted do have similar blood types, or it runs in the family. You hear the grandpa had an experience, the dad, the daughter. Um, there could be something to that. While I've begun investigating this topic from the perspective that people need to return to the optimism that led the way in the earliest days of research, I can't help but see why some approach the subject with such hesitance. The abduction phenomenon has thrown a wrench into the works. That makes me question if I even want to look into a phenomenon that can so quickly turn on innocent people. One interesting side note is that some purported abductees don't have the same type of negative experience that many of those taken claim to have. In fact, some believe the experience to be overwhelmingly positive. Whatever the case might be, an experiencer seems to undergo a traumatic event that never fades from their memory and can have lingering effects that negatively or positively impact the rest of their lives. Uh, there are a lot of people that are making these claims, and these people are not just all weirdos. Some of these people are very credible. Some of them are professors, law enforcement, scientists. Uh, I mean, it runs the gamut of people making these sort of claims. For that reason, I think it's a very important uh, situation that we need to pay attention to. In most of the high-profile UFO cases deal with people who have been abducted. There's also a move towards changing the term abducted into experiencer in order to move away from some of the stigma that we find when we look at abductions generally. Oftentimes that stigma is presented in a way that conflicts with a lot of beliefs we see in today's society about appropriate behavior. So moving towards the term experiencer instead allows us to navigate away from some of that stigma and instead look at the validity of those experiences. I can just tell you there were some interesting reports. Again, some of these were very credible people. I can't say they were being abducted by aliens, but something happened to them that affected their lives. Some of them, as I recall, had some interesting uh, physical um, signs on them of something that had occurred. It was just a surreal moment for me because I'd always heard of abductions. They were always, you know, kind of cool and sensational. But until I sat down with a woman whose husband was there, believes her, supports her, and she is just so overcome with emotion and clearly some sort of trauma, uh, I had no choice but to believe something firmly happened to her. As with Phoenix, the Chestnut Ridge, or the Hudson Valley, visiting a place like Franconia pushes the people at the heart of the subject to the front of my mind. Betty Hill, later in life, believed that her own taking was an innocent and benevolent one. Betty passed away in 2004, but her story remains as much a mystery as it did when she was alive. 
while dreams, government manipulation, and even simple misidentification and outright lying have been offered up by skeptics as the cause for the Hill's abduction, we still don't know what happened in 1961. Despite this fact, I can't help but think something really did happen here all those years ago. And regardless of how she might have felt about it in her waning years, the event had to have been as baffling as it was terrifying. So they put the sign up in 2011 uh, to commemorate it, but I think it's kind of interesting just in general talking about abductions. A lot of these people, as we've found out talking to people, it seems like they actually have trauma, some sort of almost like PTSD that they kind of deal with, that having a story like this probably wouldn't do them any favors. And That's I what I was about to say. It's not gonna do them any good whatsoever. I mean, it's going to make probably a relatively I don't want to say hard life, but it's going to make things harder. It's not going to make anything easier for them. I don't know. I don't think it, it does seem, it does seem credible on the surface, at yeah. least. I mean, what about the other side of it to where you're trying to figure out a, maybe a more logical terrestrial explanation for an abduction like Betty and Barney went through? In my opinion, I think a lot of them have perhaps trauma that they have dealt with, mm -hmm. younger ages or whatever the case may be. and a way of rationalizing it is perhaps saying it's extraterrestrial as opposed to saying it's somebody maybe close to you that may have hurt you. I mean, what do you guys think the chances are that it was all the government and it was just a big experiment to see how maybe they would react and if they came out and talked about it, then how the, the public would react to their story? It's a... Uh, imaginative people. Or imaginative people. I mean, and, it really and, could and be. It really could be. Yeah, I think that's the thing about all of this is that there is an infinite amount of possibility here. I mean, you can literally throw something up and it could it could potentially be correct yeah. it could be the government working with aliens the aliens working with the government no aliens no government or any combination of of all of those there's Nobody probably knows. people who have a lot more information about this right. than we do and that's that's what kind of is, i think frustrates a lot of people and i think in some ways that may happen to uh, to betty hill as well obviously i didn't know her but people who did claim that you know she was very straight edge and and all about kind of the the experience and trying to figure out what was happening so right. Maybe that's the case as well. I don't know, but like I said, we're just sort of taking shots in the dark yeah. here, so. When every thread is so long. Yeah. Coming up. Carolyn, what are we looking at here? All right. Well, usually when people come in, um, we make sure they have a, a little book where they can document, you know, what they see, um, that they have a star chart so they know for every season. So we make sure that they know what they're looking at in the sky. So they can look at the map, they can look what's up there, and when they do see something move, then we can help them with the laser pointer and whatnot to discern if it was a satellite or not a satellite. Laser signal, which puts out a pretty powerful beam, um, it goes 20 miles and it will light a match head in five seconds. So Carolyn, why do you, why do you come out here and spend a lot of your free time gazing at the sky? Well, I do think that uh, our civilization really needs to start reaching out. And that's the only way it's gonna happen because we've been waiting for decades for disclosure and it's not coming from our own governments. So we're gonna just have to do it ourselves. And a lot of people have with some really good uh, results, including myself. What's the closest you've seen something? Have you gotten a little bit nervous that they've come in a little bit too, oh, too yeah. close to you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> not, But not nervous in a, in a scared way, right. more of an excited way like, right. And then, you know, they 
acknowledge you, they flash a couple more times and they're gone. So it's not a very long experience anyway. How much time do you think you've been in the field practicing this? Uh, it's going on seven years easily and off and on before that. But for about seven years, I've been coming out mostly by myself. Here. Uh -huh. But first, listen and see if you can hear any engine. It's going in a straight line, but it's not. Oh, it's whoa. Straight. Whoa, did you see that over there? Which one? Nobody saw that? What? The thing just like flew across the sky. Well, that's what like we orange hear. light. That's what we see all the time. Alex saw something orange fly across the sky. Where? Oh, let's go up here. Oh, no. It was orange. By was the like, ridge? Yeah, it went like right. It disappeared before the ridge. So yeah, so the the hills here, it was like this. It went like this. I don't know if you can see that with the laser. It was here to there, and it just like, it didn't go over the ridge. It just kind of disappeared right at the ridge, and that was it. Hmm. That's like the house. It's been almost a year since I started on this trip in search of answers. One year of traveling the US, meeting investigators and witnesses, and looking to the skies for any sign that what people are claiming to see actually exists. I came into this adventure knowing full well the odds of seeing anything for myself were slim. Despite what the mass array of paranormal themed television shows currently floating around the bowl of networks might tell you, simply going to a location where someone has seen something strange before doesn't come close to guaranteeing your own encounter. This goes doubly for UFOs, a phenomenon so beyond our reach that it actually seems to be just messing with us. I guess it's the elusiveness of the target and the frustration I feel after failing to see anything for myself that makes me wonder just what it is that keeps the average enthusiast or researcher coming back to the subject day after day. How do you find the willpower to continue looking, 
when logic would dictate that there are better ways to spend your time than chasing shadows in the fog. My entire life changed when I saw that UFO. Like the entire path of that I was on uh, was changed. I, I'm now talking about UFOs all the time, every day. This is a part of my life. And I never saw that. I, I never wanted that. For me, the more stories I heard, the more excited I got to possibly find answers. If we ever will about what UFOs are, I, I can't tell you. But the journey almost means more to me. While Ryan Sprague's research keeps him within the confines of one of the most populated cities in the country, Butch Witkowski has been investigating around the state of Pennsylvania for years. Butch has a career in law enforcement behind him and utilizes his previous training while investigating strange cases around the Keystone State. More recently, he's invested thousands of dollars into making his research more mobile. I had my first sighting in 1989 with seven other people in my front yard in Tucson, Arizona. The bug bit me and that's where I've been ever since, so it's been 30 some years now that I've been involved in this. I was a member of MUFON in 2007 to 2009. I left them as a chief investigator, star team member, and state section director and started my own group, which was the UFO Research Center Pennsylvania. Carolyn The Rock has been researching the UFO subject since she was a kid. Carolyn has a background in environmental biology and due to her retirement, now spends most of her free time attempting to have an interaction with what she believes to be a metaphysical phenomenon. I've been involved in the UFO subject matter my entire life because my father was a DOD contractor my entire life. And so he worked on advanced technologies for a long time and he used to go to meetings over at Hanscom Air Force Base down in Massachusetts and we would go and hang out outside watching planes land while he was having meetings on different technologies. Pretty much started just looking into the UFO phenomenon. Still got nowhere. I mean, I bought books, I papers, started accumulating all kind of information that took me no place at all. So I joined MUFON. Uh, like I said, I became a state section director, chief investigator for the state. Everybody got all this information, it went in the CMS files, and the story. And I just made up my mind I was going to start my own group. Got a bunch of like-minded guys together that I knew, that had been doing it a long time, and uh, said, let's do this. Since your dad was involved in DOD, does that inform the way you investigate UFOs? Initially it did. I was, because my dad is a hardcore nuts and bolts scientist, and it was Two different, two different key things happened. In 2016, I had my dog out, and it was well after 10 o'clock sometime, and I kind of felt a buzzing, and I caught a little bit of movement out of the corner of my eye, so I turned around, and then I could kind of get a feel that there was something moving very slowly across the sky overhead, like a barge. If you've ever seen a barge go down a river, how slow that it moves, and so that kind of kick-started me and it was it was super long I mean it just kept going and going and going so we ended up moving from this one house in Samberton over to Guilford and right before we moved in December I was out with my dog this time it was at 3 in the morning and I saw you know that you always see a star moving and I know it's not a satellite and so I'm I was just kind of to the point where I was like I've been looking at you guys for 30 years in my mind I'm thinking I just want to know if you're a UFO, if you're an extraterrestrial, what are you? Because I was just exhausted of seeing these things and not knowing and wanting to know that bad. So as soon as I thought that, it changed direction, came in close and did that classic flashbulb effect, you know? That's kind of how I made the transition from the nuts and bolts looking at the sky and, and whatnot to more of um, now, I'm very much into the emotional contact with what I see in the sky. Investigators and researchers looking into the UFO subject are often treated with a certain level of disdain by scientists and academics. After all, most of the people actively investigating the subject don't have training or a background in the fields that would correlate with the study of unknown aerial phenomena to begin with. 
Dating all the way back to the days of Kenneth Arnold's sighting, the field of ufology has been bolstered by average people who spend inordinate amounts of time looking into something that in some way has impacted their lives to such a degree that they'll give up free time, massive amounts of personal funds, and even their family lives to chase UFOs. Yet, despite the occasional exception, most of those involved in the search aren't in it for money or fame. They're simply seeking answers. How does like a typical investigator go, go about looking into a sighting report? So when it comes to investigation, it's tough. There's no like official field manual. There's no degree you get in ufology. My mentor, Peter Robbins, always says to be a ufologist, you just spin around three times and touch your nose and you're a ufologist. And I guess that's kind of how we all do it. We're just stumbling through it. Can you walk us through like what a typical investigation actually entails? Like someone calls you or contacts sure. you and... Well, uh, contact is usually one of two ways. It's by the net on the website, on one of our websites, or it comes from another investigator. That will automatically, you know, if I have the contact information, I'll call that person, set up a meeting. I don't like to do things over the phone and I hate to do things over the internet. So I want to see them face to face. I want to be where they were, what they saw, so I can take I can take readings, I can take samples, I can take photographs, I can take measurements, I can do everything I need to do. See, that's a part that kind of makes me crazy because people got to understand there's a difference between research and investigations. Research is just knowledge. Investigations is out in the field, and not many people do that anymore. Can you explain what CE5 is to people that may not know? Sure, it's basically where uh, you, the person, is initiating contact. It's not like you got abducted against your will or anything like that. It's like you were out there, you asked for contact, and you, you got it in some fashion, whether it was a sighting or a message or whatever. In my case, it was the light bulb flashes and a profound emotional connection that, you know, like when we go out and do sky watches now i've been having a hard time finding a group that can settle in and really work on that level because they're too chatty and they're not like letting themselves get to that level so i have found my best success is when i'm out either by myself or like a couple other people i often call myself a collector of stories but in my time collecting those stories i've come to find that more often times than not I'm also sort of a therapist or sounding board for people who've experienced things that defy explanation. Someone will tell me about something traumatic or terrifying or simply bizarre that happened in their life, and in doing so, a weight is lifted. For many of these people, I might be the first person they've ever told. The same holds true for many involved in the UFO subject. While seeking answers is important, many of those who talk to witnesses and experiencers come to find that in offering an ear to listen, they've also created a safe place for someone who might otherwise never be able to express something that has potentially changed their entire worldview. I mean, when you do put yourself out there in those public platforms, people will constantly reach out to you. And it's great. I love it. I love meeting new people. I love hearing from more witnesses. Every person to me that comes forward with a UFO case or experience, uh, it normalizes the topic. So immediately I will respond and just say, thank you for sending this. And a lot of the times they just want someone to give it to instead of just keeping it in. My name's Mike Stevens. We're in Stratum, New Hampshire at the KRI Center for Consciousness Studies and I'm the founder of Grand Sky, which is a support group for experiencers, which I run out of here. But when you say su support groups are, I mean, how does, it, how does it function? It kind of brings people of like-minded experiences together. The biggest part of it is letting them know they're not alone and that so they don't feel crazy or stuck with this thing they've been told isn't real their whole life while they've been having traumatic experiences. What prompted you to, to start that? Um, I had my own experiences at a really early age. So when I got to the point of coming to terms with them, I kind of said, well, I can't let anybody else do this without making an effort. The types of reports and the types of reporting, they're all the same. I mean, you've got to be diligent. You've got to, you've got to talk to the people. You've got to ask those questions.
you can pretty much tell when somebody's giving you a snowball job. You know what I mean? There was a UFO case that I looked at about a year ago in Brooklyn, New York, where a girl had called me frantically. She was a coworker of mine. She called me at like two in the morning. I'd never talked to this person on the phone before. Uh, so I was, I was scared. I was nervous. I didn't know what was going on. And she calls and she said, Ryan, Ryan, you're the only person I thought of. There is this huge red light outside my window and it's coming closer and it's getting brighter and then it's going back up into the sky and coming down and pulsating. And I don't know what to do. Should I call the police? And I, like, I immediately jumped into investigator mode. I, I told her, just calm down. Is it hot? Like, is it burning you or anything like that? Like, making sure she was okay. And she said, no, 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 it's not that close, but it's super scary. Is it making any noise? Um, is anyone else in your house that can, you know, verify this, this, that, this, that? And I told her immediately, I said, get off the phone with me and start recording it. Is it still there? And she said, yes. And she did. Why are people, I guess, why are people so hesitant to discuss their, their own experiences? Do you think that, that it... I think one, we've been conditioned to believe that it's not true, it's not real. And the other one is, uh, you know, fear, ridicule of losing their job, friends, family. Um, you know, I know people who have had full blown, you know, what you'd call abduction experiences. Their husband will sit down and watch ancient aliens with them, but thinks it could have happened to you. So there's a lot of play with it, even within the field of people who possibly believe in it. And the biggest challenge when it comes to investigating UFOs is by the time it's recorded, it's already gone. So there's rarely anything to ever investigate. So for me, it comes down to the witnesses. And a lot of people don't don't put a lot of credence in the witness testimony because it is just a story. Unless a piece of that craft was left behind or some sort of trace evidence, um, there's not much to ever really investigate. So it is a, it's a field of investigation that I think is more research and more uh, journalistic than it ever truly was investigating. You know, the search for fame and fortune has pretty much destroyed ufology. The search for the truth, that's what I want. I don't want the game, I don't want the embellishment. I want proof, I want the truth. And let me tell you something, it's out there. It is out there. I know there's people who go like, ah, bah humbug, that's a lot of crap, you know, this, that, the other. Yeah, well, I've seen things that I can't explain. And from my prior police experience, I can pretty much explain anything. I mean, how many times have you heard, oh, so cathartic just to tell someone or just to share it with someone? Absolutely. Most of them say like, oh, you have no, like a weight was lifted off my chest. And for some people, it's very easy to talk about their UFO settings. They want to tell you and they'll tell you at great length. And there's others who it's hard to pull it out of them. They may not know what they saw or ever find out what it was, but they might have some sort of closure in knowing that someone is willing to listen to them. Across the United States, UFOs continue to grow in popularity, with new voices coming into the field daily. It's the first time we've seen anything like it since the 1970s, and unlike that period of history, the phenomenon is being taken somewhat more seriously now by academics and government officials. But I can't get past the idea that amateurs, experiencers, and witnesses who have been touched by the subject are the ones who will continue to drive it forward. Investigators like Hynek, Ballet, and Friedman are the reason there is even a public awareness of the subject today. And to some degree, this fact could end up lost in a world infatuated with Tic Tacs and conspiracy theories. But as we move forward into a new era in the field of UAPs, I'm really left to wonder what is left to look into. The phenomenon remains just out of reach, while the motivating factor for many of those acting as mouthpieces for the subject tends to be fame or money. What do you even say to those who have witnessed something or just have a newfound interest that want to seek answers for themselves? I don't know, for a young person starting out doing this, I, I, the only thing I would say was don't let your ego get in the way, really. 
don't think that you're the most important thing or that you're going to, everybody's gonna pay attention to you. If you concentrate on the thing that makes you the most excited, that makes, that makes you the most happy and it, that you really wanna know the answers to, you'll get attention, it'll just happen just as a result of you're doing good work. And if you don't do good work, who cares? You know, <laughs> at least you're gonna have some fun. There's a movement back towards uh, what started to happen in the 70s with uh, people like Dr. G. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée, where we were trying to focus investigation of the subject towards real scientific methodology and real scientific legitimacy, a real observation of phenomena in the field. And I think there's a move back towards that uh, coming up. I would say, first of all, read as much as you possibly can because there's a wealth of information that's out there. Everyone in their own generation tends to think of themselves as sort of the pioneers. But in this field in particular, there is decades worth of raw material out there that's already been compiled. And you have to put yourself in places where your chances of seeing something for yourself increase. That's not to say that anyone who ever goes out looking for a UFO will see one. You know, there's people like Stan Gordon who have been in this field for over 50 years who have immersed themselves in the subject who have never seen a thing. With that caveat, I think you have to say, as an investigator, you have to hit the bricks, you have to talk to people, you have to learn the art of not only asking the right questions, but really listening to people and not guiding their answers in any way, but just letting them talk. Get out from behind the keyboard. You, you can't really delve into this field sitting at your computer. You can learn a lot, sure, but a large portion of what's you're gonna find on the internet, it, it's gonna be those political debates, it's gonna be those opinions and, and arguments. Remember, nobody ultimately has the answer. Find some mentors, find some people you respect, read, 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 and get out and learn some solid investigative techniques. You know, Get your boots on the ground, be in the field, talk to the witnesses, and begin to understand that there is a much bigger question going on here than any organization is gonna sit down and solve with a few pieces of paper. I guess the first thing I'd say to look at, I'm a little biased, but uh, I, I think this is why I do what I do. What I'm trying to do is be very journalistic about it, just to write the facts, share with you what is substantiated and what is credible. So at least in that sense, our attempt is to give you an unbiased look at uh, these different situations. And I think it's a good place to start because I think people should know what the government has done, um, what very credible researchers have done as a good base before you kind of jump off and get into some of the really weird stuff. And it's a little scary because there's, there are a lot of cults out there and you have to be careful of some of these charlatans that are kind of selling a world view. Don't expect to make any money. It's a... Uh, if you have another local organization that you like, join it. Uh, read uh, almost anything by Jacques Vallée. Uh, believe about one-fourth of what you hear, two-thirds of what you see, and attend conferences, ask lots of questions, and anybody that's making a lot of money off of this is probably a fool and a charlatan. Do you think we'll have an answer to the, to the UFO mystery? Do you think there is a mystery? Oh, I think we will. I think uh, the answer's out there. For me to put a limitation on the universe is somewhat more than I think I'm capable of doing. And to say that it's this or it's this and make it something that's exclusive would be a little arrogant, I believe. So, no, I, I don't do that. I, I don't see how I can. Yeah, what happens if at the end of your life you have no more answers than you did at the start? I actually, I did a lot of thinking about that recently when uh, the late Stan Friedman passed away. This guy had been investigating UFOs for 50 years of his life. And you think about all these people who came before you that researched this topic, passing away and not finding any of the answers they sought. You can only hope they're finding them now in the afterlife. I, I don't know, but it's, 
depressing and sobering to think we may never find an answer to what UFOs are. But again, that life journey for me, it's been worth it. Meeting people, talking to them. I love it. I love going places. I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories. And I honestly feel that every UFO story has some sort of value. Again, not to find answers, but to possibly tell us more about ourselves than whatever the UFOs actually represent. Maybe it's fitting that my trip would wrap up in a place so important to ufology. Hollywood has done more to push the UFO subject into the national consciousness than most realize. Though it's probably worth mentioning that the end results usually leave a lot to be desired. We came here to get a final handful of interviews and to make plans for what we'll be doing next. But before we can look into the future, we have to analyze the past and present. I think it's easier for people to come out and, and talk about the subject, but I really don't know if that means that a lot of people still feel that it's okay to do so because they're still in their their circle of friends and their life and their serious jobs and at the end of the day it's still up to them regardless of what all the rest of us are doing if they want to come out and talk about it but i feel like it's a big part of it is to gather more and more information and more data about what's going on what what do you feel like your ultimate goal was with with the trip like with going around the country and speaking to so many witnesses and investigators like what what did you come into this wanting to get out of it and what are you leaving with? I always come at things from the personal side of it, so the, the people side of it. Well, Ryan Sprague has told me before, he's like, I'm good, I saw it once, I know it was something very strange. Sean, Kim, Jason or someone like that, they're always looking up, they're always trying to see something else. Again, that'll probably add only more questions for them. That's also something that we set out to do is to prove that hopefully there are still people just simply gazing at the sky. Yeah, it's great to hear about the craft, but I mean, Greg Bishop really touched on this a lot, was, okay, well, that's, that's great. What did the craft do? How fast did it fly off? You know, what angle did you see it? What was the moon doing? But what about the people involved? The, the, you already mentioned they had their lives changed. Some of these people, they don't sleep right. They, they're obsessed with finding out more and more and more. And it's something that some of these folks, it's all that they do. It, whether or not they're on a podcast or, or doing some of the things that we do, yeah. it's taken over their lives. Now, despite what I thought one year ago, you can't simply walk out your front door and encounter UFOs. People like Stanton Friedman or Ron Regeer have devoted the better part of their lives to investigating this subject of identified flying objects. And in retrospect, analyzing it for myself is something I just can't put a stop to and declare that I lean one way or the other. UAP exists. From the skies above Sedona to the forests of Brown Mountain, there are objects or lights which defy explanation that are being witnessed by ordinary people. But I still don't know what they are. And despite traveling thousands of miles, I've barely scratched the surface of the decades-long history of the study. If I've learned one thing during this journey, it's that you can't put an expiration date on the search for the truth. This year has been many things, eye-opening, exhausting, and exciting. But most of all, this year was just the beginning. Come <laughs> on.